Okay, everyone, uh, thanks for joining us for the first uh, talk of the year, uh, which is going to be given by Jordan from Zama, and he's going to be telling us about some of their work on fully homomorphic encryption. Thank you, Thomas. Um, but first, if anyone has questions, I don't see the, the chat, so not easy day to interrupt me. Uh, so my name is Jordan Freire. I'm working currently at Zama, uh, where we are uh, developing solutions around fully homomorphic encryption. Uh, prior to that, I worked as a data scientist and did a, a PhD in uh, machine learning uh, based on uh, fraud detection. So today I'm going to present you um, an open source library that we developed around the core uh, product of Zama, which is uh, a library that does fully homomorphic encryption. And this open source library is uh, essentially uh, doing machine learning on encrypted data using the homomorphic encryption. So to give a brief overview of fully homomorphic encryption, uh, just uh, a small disclaimer, I'm from the machine learning domain. So uh, I'm gonna give uh, the overview here. Uh, and I'll try to answer the questions you have, but uh, um, yeah. So currently we live in a, let's say, untrustable world where a client and a server have to kind of set up a trust such that um, the client can get some service from a, a third party, a server. Um, let's say you send something like a, um, a mail to a server and you want the server to basically do the spam detection uh, algorithm over the, the mail. Since it's a complicated task, you often don't do this locally, so you just send the mail to the server. But uh, you've got to send the whole uh, clear text to the server. And server executes the, the algorithm to detect whether it's spam and it sends you back um, the prediction whether or the probability uh, of the mail to be a spam or not. So of course there is a bit of a problem here uh, since there is some kind of trust that is implied uh, because the server not only has access to your mail but also has access to the prediction which basically gives a lot of information about uh, the client. So what is FHE? FHE aims at uh, providing a, a, a privacy for the user. So what happens is that, um, let's take the spam detection example again. You take the, the mail, you would encrypt the mail uh, locally at the, at the client machine, and you would send this encrypted um, data point uh, to the server, and the server, thanks to fully homomorphic encryption, would be able to execute the same function as it would have done on the clear data and send you back uh, the encrypted result. So of course, it's, it applies the function of uh, the encrypted data. The result of this function is also encrypted. And the only uh, the client, which has access to the private key, which it used uh, to encrypt the data, can decrypt uh, the results of the function that has been executed on the server, right? So let's dig a bit more into FHE. Here you are represented X and Y, which can be two that, are, that have been encrypted uh, with a specific uh, private key. In FHE, to maintain uh, the security, you have some noise in what's called the ciphertext, so the encrypted uh, X and the encrypted Y. You have some noise, which here is represented by the green the green level here. All right, so when you add them uh, together, uh, so two ciphertexts together, uh, you increase very slightly the noise. So if you would do a very long sum, uh, it would increase more, but uh, it, it, so it, this is how uh, having operation in FHE works. So you would having arithmetic operation between two ciphertexts would uh, um, increase the 
a bit the noise. But that's not too bad here for the addition. With the multiplication, same thing, if you multiply a ciphertext with a constant, the noise remains kind of stable. So what I mean by stable is that once the noise reaches this uh, red level here, uh, what happens is that, oops, what happens is that um, then the noise is basically um, overwriting like the, the actual data that is that has been stored in the in the in the ciphertext. So when you do a lot of computations, you will arrive to a point where the noise is quite high. So in fully homomorphic encryption, there is something called a programmable bootstrapping, uh, which you call here PBS. In at our level, at the machine learning level, this programmable bootstrapping can be seen as a simple table lookup. So essentially, just mapping uh, just a univariate mapping a univariate function from an integer uh, to another integer, right? Um, and this is quite interesting because this table lookup allows us to have some kind of nonlinearity in the FHC circuit, but also when you apply a, boot, a PBS, it decreases the noise. So you can keep working with this, this uh, ciphertext that comes right after the PBS. So this is why um, machine learning becomes very interesting in this case, because you could have very long um, circuits and always play around these uh, PBSs to decrease the noise and keep going with the computations. So let's tackle a bit uh, more machine learning use cases here. So of course, the first one that comes uh, to mind is based on healthcare, where uh, machine learning is a bit uh, stuck uh, today because of obvious reasons um, of data being very sensible to share uh, and, and compromises some privacy uh, from the users. Of course, there are a lot of different applications that can be done, like face recognition, voice detection, fraud detection. Basically, any arithmetic functions uh, can that represents machine learning models can be done uh, in FHE. So, machine learning currently with the fully homomorphic encryption um that we have now we are performing the training of the machine learning model on non-encrypted data it can be done with the open source library i'm going to present right after um but it can be done with anything uh, you'd like and the library is supposed to convert any machine learning model to its uh, fhe equivalent and the the pros of concrete ML for now is to allow the inference on encrypted data. So you could train your model, um, push this to concrete ML, and you would get an FHE circuit, which is with the, the, the crypto parameters to encrypt the data. So you would have to create a private key as a client. You would have to, uh, the, the, the secret key as well. And, um, and then you could deploy the FHE circuit in an untrusted server, which would burn the inference of encrypted data. So we provide also in this library the, the fast simulation and the deployment mode. Uh, I might come back to this later. So fully homomorphic encryption, uh, as just said, basically imply three kinds of operations. So additions, multiplications, and this uh, programmable bootstrapping, which for us is going to be uh, a table lookup, a very simple table lookup. And in machine learning, uh, what you would get is matrix multiplications, which represents like more than 90% of all the operations you actually do um, in, in machine learning models. So multiplication and additions, those are pretty fine uh, to do in, uh, in, in a morphic encryption. And the second part is nonlinearities. So in neural nets, for example, you want to break the linearity 
uh, by adding some activation function, nonlinear activation functions. Uh, you could also have, uh, as we will see in trees, you have some comparisons between values uh, that breaks the linearity. And this is going to be represented using a table lookup. So overall, fully homomorphic encryption and machine learning can be matched by having two kind of uh, main operations. Uh, so you have the ciphertext, uh, so encoded, encode, uh, encrypted uh, inputs that comes in the machine learning model that can do whatever uh, kind of um, computation uh, it, 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 it needs to be done. So here the function represents um, the PBSs. So those could be nonlinear activation and you want in FHE to represent that the, them with a table lookup. The sum would be just, you know, matrix multiplication. And, uh, and then you can, thanks to the PBSs, so the functions here, you would be able to go very deep without actually uh, destroying the ciphertext uh, because of this noise increasing, since you can actually uh, use the bootstrapping to uh, decrease the noise step by step. In neural nets, uh, these PBSs happen every at every level, often at every level. So after uh, matrix multiplications, convolutions, and, and and things like that. Great. So now. Um, Let's uh, have a look at concrete ML. So it's available on GitHub um, publicly. We are we are trying to release every every three months um, updates. Uh, as we are working with uh, the research uh, teams on that work on fully homomorphic encryption, uh, we bring a lot of different um, improvements every 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 three months. So you can check it out on GitHub. This library has been designed so, so that um, people that with absolutely no crypto knowledge uh, could actually use it. The only thing that uh, will be needed to know is um, that you have to create uh, keys and, 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 but basically training the model and deploying would be very simple here. We try to be as close as possible as what data scientists and machine learning practitioners are used to to have. So in those there is like we, we support Torch and, and and TensorFlow, but also all the models, uh, most of the models uh, that are available in a circuit learn and ONNX. We are it's a representation of machine learning models using a uh, kind of a graph uh, abstraction. And it turns out that most of the machine learning framework can be uh, converted, uh, model can be converted to ONNX, which is the main um, entry point to concrete ML. So of course we have the all the, the popular uh, API that you can have in Python when you work in machine learning uh, with the feed, training a model, predict a, uh, um, over some data, and you have you have some pipeline and grid search also support. Yeah. So now let's dig in how we actually change the machine learning model to make it uh, FHE friendly. So in FHE, uh, at least currently, we can only work uh, with integers. So computation have to be done with integers only. And to do this, uh, quantization, we use quantization, which is an approach that allows transforming floating points to integers. Uh, so if you take a, a, a distribution like the Gaussian distribution, you just cut the distribution of the full range. Or you can actually choose different um, quantile if you want. Um, and you define an, a precision, which would be like, for example, eight bits, on or four bits, uh, and you cut to your space into the number of uh, available uh, precision. Uh, a more visually example, more visual example would be uh, with pictures. 
every pixel in a picture is represented with 8 bits, so 256 values. If you would quantize the, the, the picture, you would see that you would lose some information along the way until you reach a single bit here, which allows to have, uh, because there are RGB channels in, in picture, it allows to have some kind of a similarity. But if you would feed the right picture to a machine learning model while it has learned over the first picture, the 8 bits one, uh, then you would get some kind of loss in the accuracy. So let's look at what's available in uh, in, in concrete ML and what kind of machine learning model we, we support here. So the first kind of model are tree-based model. So decision trees, random forest, and, and Exibus, which is a gradient boosting algorithm, um, pretty popular in machine learning. Then we have linear models. Uh, so basically linear regression, uh, generalized linear models, uh, logistic regression, SVMs and, and, and others. Um, and finally, uh, others that appear here, SVM, elastic net, lasso reach. And then finally, uh, we enter the world of neural networks. We have built-in neural networks such that user can actually train their neural nets and the neural net is going to be converted to FHE instantly. Or uh, we can also design the neural network using Torch, TensorFlow, uh, ONNX, uh, if you will. And once the neural net is learned, you can basically push that to concrete ML, which will do the conversion to the FHE equivalent. So let's take a look at tree based model here. The tree-based model uh, have a challenge, which comes from the fact that they are built with if-else statements. So in a tree traversal with encrypted input, you would have to do comparison between uh, the, for example, here, the X3, which would be encrypted, and a clear value, which would, would be in the clear, um, with this, this kind of thing. But comparison, uh, doing a greater than, uh, is not directly possible in FHE, right? So what we do is representing this comparison with a table lookup. So imagine you have X3 here, uh, which is equal to five. So the comparison X3 greater than three could be represented with a table lookup uh, with only those zeros, four zeros and four ones. Uh, what it means is that, like, look so here, x3, you, you would just pass the x3 as the index, and the, it will return whether it is actually uh, greater than 3 or not. So this is essentially how we can do comparison in FHE now. So the second part is tree traversal. Tree traversal assume that the example is only going to go through the nodes uh, that satisfy the condition. Well, this in FHE is not directly possible because FHE, like in FHE, the, the input is encrypted. You can't really know, uh, the server can't really know whether it has to execute the left node or the right node. So, we have to execute to process every single node in the decision tree. And we do this by basically converting the, the tree traversal um, model, like inference, to only matrix multiplications and comparison, which we can do in FHE. It, so in a, it, with an ONNX graph, it would be represented like this. Um, a single straight um, graph of computations um, that computes every single uh, comparison and every single uh, condition uh, in, in, in the tree. So this works fine for also a lot of different trees as they are in like random forest, for example, or gradient boosting, uh, as it basically just adds a one dimension to the matrix multiplications. Great. 
There's um, a play stream on the previous slide? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, for, for, for these uh, tree-based models, and I, I think this question applies to a lot of other models, was there a, uh, any alternative of, like, converting the... So, like, the, the problem with these trees is if they're very deep, but if you're doing, like, random forest or something, you have shallow trees, you can sort of take advantage of parallelism. Was there an attempt to, like, re, uh, rewrite these trees in, in a different form that makes them... Um, more suitable for the limitations of FHE? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Like random forest, for example, they are gonna they're gonna be so deep that the um, if you don't constrain them to stop at a specific level, then they're gonna explode in terms of uh, matrix dimensions here. Um, so there are we are, didn't really study ways to make the random forest the entire model with only small trees but um gradient boosting for example is basically the inverse you've got some shallow trees and you basically combine a lot of them um but very very like not deep at all so here it's completely fine for fhe but you're right uh random forest uh in their default mode uh, would be huge matrices here. Um, yeah. So I'm guess I'm guessing this this approach is probably taken to get all of the models into sort of the same TensorFlow graph input type of format so that they could be sort of uniformly processed, or is or is there like special handling for each of the different types of models? Oh, yeah, I know. So for tree based, we use we we actually use um, a library. Uh, developed by Microsoft called Hummingbird, which takes any kind of tree or ensemble of trees and transform these to the matrix multiplication representation. So uh, basically any kind of tree-based algorithm in machine learning would be represented with those nodes. Only the dimensions and the values uh, to compare with uh, would change. So yeah, was that the question? Or... Yeah, thank you. Okay, cool. Uh, okay, great. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, so the way we use um, concrete ML to develop a uh, model, to train model and, and, and predict and, and stuff like that, is very similar to what we would have, for example, with scikit-learn. So you just import uh, a model, which we chose to give the same name as they are represented in, in scikit-learn. Or in their own library. Um, so you just define the model, and one of the most important uh, parameter you have to give to the model when in initializing is the number of bits of precision over which you want um, the input data to be represented. So for trees, it's less constraining than for neural nets because every single feature is going to be quantized with eight bits of precision. So you've got for one feature, 256 different values available, and for the second feature, 256. While for neural nets, you would have to quantize the whole input at once because, um, of course, you send a lot of different inputs into neurons and and doing different quantization um, while then doing addition and uh, and multiplications on those quant differently quantized um, inputs would be very tricky to handle. So here, yeah, you can just uh, train the model. Uh, so you define the n-bits, you can train the model with the fit function, uh, then call predict, which would run basic clear inference. So you can actually test, debug the model, find, compute some metrics, uh, which here would be uh, pretty fast because uh, it's just everything in clear. Uh, but it will give you the FHE uh, accuracy because we run, we make sure that uh, the cryptography parameters uh, allow you to have um, something like one over a hundred thousand um, chance to give the wrong output. Uh, so then you can just compile the model. This compile function is going to take some representative uh, data set and, and, and transform the model um, into different steps until it reaches the, 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 the compiled. Uh, so we have an MLI uh, representation of the model. And then, and then we can basically execute um, FHE um, operation, pure operations, uh, following this um, MLIR. And yeah, of course, you can check the execution time. 
um, by just simply setting the executing FHE here, right? Uh, of course, X, X test here is not encrypted. It's just for debugging purposes for data scientists. Um, but then you can, uh, once you are ready, you can just uh, split the client and the, and the server and, and, and then deploy, basically. So those are a few uh, experiments uh, of a spam-based data set uh, where we take the floating point 32 uh, metric. So we have the F1 metric and the average precision metric. And we compute the metrics for different um, so bit width would be the n bits parameter that you just saw before. And of course, with one and two, uh, uh, the damage the, the done to the accuracy, so the F1 and the average precision is pretty uh, pretty huge, but you convert very quickly to the floating point uh, 32 um, metrics, which is, which is great. And on the bottom, you can see the inference time for a single example. Um, so, of course, uh, here uh, I probably would need to give you more information about what's the size of the random forest actually boost and decision trees, but uh, yeah. Well, uh, a minute on time here? But, uh, knowing FHG, that could be minutes or seconds or. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, very good point. Uh, so, those are seconds. Those are seconds. Um, we, we basically here use the default parameter we have in Concrete ML. Uh, I think there is no depth limit for decision trees. There is a depth limit for XJBoost, and uh, I think we set six of depth for random forest. So decision tree, of course, it's a single tree, so uh, it's pretty fast. Uh, but you can see that uh, from one to six, it uh, will triple in terms of uh, execution time. Um, random forest, as you guessed, uh, is the most uh, costly uh, of the tree-based model. Uh, because it just builds very deep trees. And XJBoost has a, I guess, a, it's more friendly to FHG because it builds very shallow trees while having good accuracy. Did, did you say how big the decision tree classifier example was for like three seconds, like roughly how big was the resulting network or the tree that started? Well, there? yeah, so we don't set a limit on the depth. Um, so it will very much depend on the data set uh i can't i can't really tell you it's a very good point i should actually write the the, the complexity of the models here uh, but yeah so it's basically trying to classify uh, the spam base uh, training set uh properly but it's a single tree while we have 100 here and 100 here so um, yeah uh yeah so and there a few visualization graph uh, just to show that um, even though the decision boundaries are not set at the same place because of course we quantize the input space I will also basically quantize the output space in trees uh, well also in your nets so um, so you have got some different kind of uh, decision boundaries but the results are very uh, very similar in the end. Oh, and something I didn't mention before, but we see some kind of uh, an effect that we didn't really expect before, like when running that, is that a quantization has some kind of uh, a regularization uh, effect here, right? Like the concrete has some kind of uh, better accuracy for a moment, just be because quantization makes uh, data less uh, precise. So. Uh, great. So now linear models. So we have a, a few of them. Uh, we basically tried to cover all the linear models that were implemented in Scikit-Learn. Um, the good part here is that it is what we, it is what we call leveled FHE. It's a circuit, an FHE circuit, which does not contain uh, programmable bootstrapping. What this allows us is that we have a we have a condition on programmable bootstrapping that I didn't say before, is that we cannot go over a certain number of bits of precision. Uh, so uh, if I can give you an example. Like uh, a year ago, we were at around six bits for um, the input of a PBS. It couldn't go over that. Uh, we went to seven, uh, eight very quickly, and now we are at 16. 
So the accumulator cannot go to 32 bits, but we, we've got like a 16 bits, which is um, quite, quite good. But this does not apply to linear models because there is no PBS. So here you can do very large sum. Uh, we can go up to 30 bits. Uh, so for example, here, the number of bits we have uh, is a quantization on the input, but also on the weights. So you're going to do like uh, 12 bits, um, 12 bits uh, times uh, 12 of the bits, uh, and then adding a bit bias. So you're going to have some really large precision, uh, really large, relatively really large precision in the accumulator here. So essentially, this allows us to match um, the floating point 32 um, accuracy, but also the runtime is is just uh, super fast. We we just match uh, um, by it by an order of of magnitude, of course, uh, the floating point 32 um, execution time. Uh, in this visualization, we can see that uh, while we are in the input range the model behave quite similarly as the the one on floating point 32. you can maybe see like the artifact like the um, the fact that basically the quantization makes the out of bound like out of um, range uh, input that is just without any value so in the fhc it's uh, it's basically uh, going to overflow and this is not something we want that's why when you compile a model you would want to give an as a representative input data point like uh, as possible and uh, now comes the last part so neural networks uh, the first thing is that we have built-in neural networks so essentially just a neural net classifier neural net regressor right and you can see it gives uh, things like that. So as I said, one complexity with neural nets is that they do very large multi-sum. And then there is a PBS. So it's not like linear models, we can just have very large uh, precision. We have to make this the accumulator. So for every single neural you are in a neural net, you have to uh, make the accumulator uh, less than 16 bits. So you can do this by either um, quantizing the inputs over lower bits, or you can apply different kind of uh, regularization to make the accumulator remain around zero. Uh, there are a lot of different ways where you can also basically just break the, um, the matrix multiplication into several uh, different matrix multiplications. Um, but yeah, the main point is that the accumulator must not go over 16 bits to be able to use it in a PBS. Uh, so here you can see the quantization uh, boundaries, which are much less smoother, smooth, uh, smooth that, and then um, the floating point, of course. But the the the, the accuracy remains remains uh, kind of stable. Um, here to train the neural net and make it like quantize it, we, are, we have kind of two different ways. The first way is training a neural net network and just applying what we call post-training quantization. Um, in this kind of quantization, you just uh, naively take the input, quantize it, take the weights, quantize it, and that's it. Uh, you don't do anything else to your neural net. Of course, you would calibrate the activations, uh, but once it's done, it's done. So here to have a bit more uh, accuracy, we use quantization aware training, where uh, during the training of the neural net, you fake quantization. Uh, so in the inference part, you apply quantization to the weights and to the um, activations, uh, also the inputs. And um, so the neural net sees only n bits of precision. And then you apply the gradients over the 14.32 uh, weights, of course. And that way you can converge to a much better solution, which make the final uh, neural net uh, great with great accuracy um, with only integers. 
The second part is one that we are actively developing. This one is developing a custom neural network. So you could take, uh, for example, TensorFlow um, and create, a, like for example here, a fully connected model. So you can do whatever you want in the in the in the model, uh, with the exception of a few operations that are um, that will be available soon, but very costly in FHE. Uh, those are, for example, for example, ranking or doing something like uh, max pooling, uh, which are costly operation. Could be done, but uh, a bit more costly. And uh, so the first step is, so you basically create your Keras model. Uh, let's say it's the fully connected here. You transform it to ONNX. So there are um, different libraries that actually do this um, very easily. And then you can just send this into a concrete ML uh, function, which is called compile ONNX model. So here we take the graph, we transform it to um, to NumPy functions, and then we use uh, an, another open source library developed by Zama, which is called Concrete NumPy, which essentially um, convert any NumPy um, functions to their morphic equivalent. And then you can simply so you have a quantized module here returned by Concrete ML, and then you can call this FHE circuit uh, that can run. Uh, over uh, encrypted data. And of course, here from, from there, you can also split server client and, and deploy easily. So um, we recently developed this for uh, a VGG-like network uh, using quantization aware training. So if I plot this into a graph representation using the Onenix uh, format, you'd see that uh, in the graph, you have some quantization uh, node appearing that will be very useful for us because we are going to take the, um, the parameters of this quantization and, and, and simply apply them such that now the, the weights and the results uh, at every output of quant node uh, will be integers. So, in the end, what happens is that the output of the convolution can be, so must be remain uh, less than 16 bits. And then we make the ReLU, the quant node, and the average pooling a single PBS. A single PBS for every output of the convolution, of course. But we, we fuse them together. Uh, uh, and so basically, PBS takes the output of the conv and then the output of the of the PBS is uh, going into the another convolution uh, and so on until the end of the network, um, uh, where the output can be um, dec uh, decrypted by the, the user. Um, great. So FHE guarantees privacy from a user point of view. Uh, the main the main thing here, I think, is to remove trust from the process of the user asking a service to a third party uh, because trust is not needed the server is actually just selling a, a service and uh, the user wants the service uh, the user just shouldn't have to uh, trust the server that it's not gonna leak the data or, or whatever actually even for the server it has an advantage because uh, data leak are very happen very often even though it's not actually the wheel of the company. Quantization is um, a heavy part of our open source library, uh, which is a necessary step to convert machine learning model to the FHE equivalent. So we have tree-based model and linear models which are very accurate in FHE. Uh, so of course, uh, if you take a random forest and, and, and try to have the largest random forest, you're going to have some trouble. But, uh, for example, ExaBoost models, uh, they perform really well with uh, shallow trees and give some very accurate results. So, and linear models are just uh, very, very close to their F floating point 32 uh, equivalent. 
neural network I can be more constrained. These all come from the fact that the accumulator, uh, even in quantization um, realm uh, in the research, it's very often assumed that uh, accumulator are not quantized. So even though they quantize even with low bits uh, input and weights, um, they just don't, don't quantize the accumulator. So they have a 30, 32 um, floating point accumulator that is freely available. Uh, of, like other parts also mentioned that um, the input, for example, the first layer of a neural net shouldn't be quantized. So they don't quantize it. While in FHU, we would like to have the whole model executed in the cloud rather than asking the, the user to do this. Um, but yeah. So no worry, uh, Concrete ML is built for a data scientist. Uh, we are trying to make everything uh, very simple and smooth so that a uh, user can do their, data scientists can do their work, their daily work, and not care about um, cryptographic aspect of it. So there is, a, of course, all the secret learn pipeline, like the grid search uh, to optimize the model, uh, all available. Uh, they are supported in concrete ML. So of course, no cryptographic knowledge required here, uh, unless you want to check uh, uh, how FHE is working behind the scene. Uh, you don't need to even understand quantization, at least for built-in models. Uh, if you want to do a custom uh, neural network model, then you'll have to know a bit more, of course. And custom models are also possible. So, um, this is a, a part we are actively developing right now. So many thanks. I think this uh, concludes my presentation. So we have a we have a uh, the link of our, our repository is here. Uh, don't hesitate to start it if you have some time. Uh, we are trying to make the documentation as clear as possible with uh, uh, taking into account user feedback and things like that. So. You have your community link and, and other things that we are trying to uh, do to, to reach the community. So, thanks a lot.